Last year, all of our speakers shared a common theme, that of family and friends. We are a family, a family of conservationists, hunters, sheep hunters, which is a crazy breed, but they're part of us. This year, we're going to continue on that family and friends focus, but we're going to add some other Wild Sheep Foundation values, and I, I think they're your valley, values as well. Those values of duty, honor, dedication, patriotism, commitment, and sacrifice. Tonight is my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker who exemplifies these values, our values. Ladies and gentlemen, Patrick Scrogan grew up in Brunswick, Missouri. After high school, he moved to Texas to fly crop dusters. When the United States, the free world, and our way of life was attacked on September 11, 2001, Patrick decided to join the Army as an airborne infantryman, where he graduated basic training as the Distinguished Honor Graduate. He was assigned to the 101st Airborne Division and then attended Airborne and Air Assault School. He deployed to Iraq for the initial invasion in 2003 and spent 11 months in theater doing combat missions. While there, he applied for flight school and upon gradu graduating once again as the Distinguished Honor Graduate, he was assigned to a cavalry regiment as a scout helicopter pilot. In 2006, Patrick again deployed to Iraq, where he flew over 100 combat missions. Folks, on March 1, 2007, Patrick's life was forever changed when he was in a catastrophic helicopter crash. Patrick died twice and he suffered left leg above the knee amputation, nine fractured vertebrae, a crushed pelvis, and multiple other injuries. Patrick spent over six months recovering and doing physical therapy. Patrick retired from the Army in February 2008 and began a new career as an air traffic controller in San Antonio, Texas, where he lives with his wife, Stephanie, and three kids, Terrence, Paige, and Kaylee. Patrick's military awards include the Meritorious Service Medal, multiple Air Medals, multiple Army Commendation Medals, and multiple Army Achievement Medals. Patrick has worked hard to inspire others with difficulties. He is co-host of the new TV, TV uh, series that is sponsored by Wild Sheep Foundation, Sheep Shape, and Patrick continues to volunteer his time to help wounded service members get in shape and meet their goals. He's going to speak tonight to us about goals. And to help also introduce them, John, if you could run the video. The morning of September 11, 2001 started just like any other day for Patrick Scroggin in West Texas. But the news he heard that morning changed his course completely, just as it did for millions of Americans on that unforgettable day. When I decided to go into the Army, I was, uh, I was a crop duster. I was flying in West Texas in um, it was September 11th, in um, the first airplane to hit the World Trade Center. You know, at that time, we didn't know what was going on. Really didn't think a lot about it. And uh, they called me on the radio and said, you know, another one just hit. Uh, like a lot of Americans, um, I was pissed. At that moment, I knew I, I was going to join the military. So March 1st, 2007, 2.30 in the morning, I'm flying a mission in uh, northeastern Iraq. I uh, was involved in a serious helicopter accident. There was no helicopter left. I was laying on the dirt. All the dash was folded over me, and my co-pilot was sitting up here, and I'm mud in my eyes, blood everywhere. Um, my, you know, I couldn't see out of my right eye, you know, and it's dark. I'm trying to figure out what the heck's going on. And, and uh, you know, I knew everything just felt funny. And, and uh, at that point, is, I, I believe it's the first time I flatlined. And uh, they got me back to life. And um, 
From there, I went to Balad, and I flatlined on that flight to Balad. I mean, I lost so much blood. I had blood clots in my lungs, you know. Obviously, the I was missing the leg below the knee. It was cut off clean, and then I had an open knee dislocation, and uh, my pelvis was crushed, nine fractured vertebrae, sacrum was shattered, left arm was broke, hand was shattered, eye socket was broken. Um, you know, I had a lot of... A lot of stuff, but I, I don't I don't remember a lot until uh, you know a couple months later. Patrick was so heavily sedated during the months following the helicopter crash that he has no recollection of the happenings around him. The amount of drugs administered to put Patrick in a medically induced coma would be fatal for the average person, but it was just what he needed to stay alive. They get me up into the hospital room, and all my family standing around, and. Um, my, that's the first time I saw my wife. And, uh, you know, I, she held it together really good. She really, she, you know, she's a, she's a strong woman. Um, uh, man, they were all in tears, and I couldn't figure out why. And we get up to the, to the room, and my brother Chris, he walks in, and he's just busts out. You know, he's crying, and I, I haven't seen him cry too much. And, and I was like, man, don't worry about it. When I get out of here, we're going to go, you know, we're going to go hunting, do all this and that. And, He's like, bro, you're missing your leg. I'm like, no, I'm not. I can feel it. And I'm like, I'm moving it right now. I'm touching the ground. I, th I thought, you know, I had no idea. And uh, yeah, so it took a few days for me to realize, my leg's gone. Um, and uh, <sighs> the first time I put my prosthetic leg on to walk, um, when I put that leg on time, that was the most frustrating point in my life. A lot of the muscles in my, in my left side of my body didn't work, my butt. Like, I would try to cock my body and swing the leg through. And, but it didn't happen, like, I, even that, you know, I mean, it would come through real slow. The toe would drag, and, and um, I probably maybe for 15 minutes, it seemed like three hours I was trying to walk for 15 minutes, and I'm holding on to two rails, you know, and I'm thinking, I'm just, I sit down in a chair, and I look down, and, you know, people were trying to talk, my therapist was trying to talk to me and, and uh, you know, leave me alone. I, I want to deal with this. And, uh, you know, I had to, that's something I had to come to terms with. Um, and uh, every day, man, I would just practice and practice and practice and practice. I wasn't like the hard charging, you know, rock soldier. I mean, I, I was depressed. I, I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, for, you know, a good, good three or four weeks, I was at the lowest of low points. I mean, I could not figure out. It was why me every day. Why, why? But it was when my family wheeled me out into a hall and I saw that first burn patient that was burned 90% um, of his body. And uh, I, um, I went back in my room that night and I told my wife, I'll never bitch again. And I didn't. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Patrick Scroggins. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's hard for me to watch that. I get pretty emotional. Um, I probably will tonight as well. Uh, I want to start off, I want to thank each and every one of you. Um, I wouldn't be standing up here if it wasn't for all of you. Uh, for sponsoring Sheep Shape, for being the, the mentors for me and for my kids, some building an organization my kids can look up to and be proud of. Um, this is this is the pinnacle of what how organizations should be run. Um, before I get started, uh, I, you know I, I wrote a speech. I don't know it was like 16 page speech or something. And flying out here today, the more I read it, the more I didn't like it, and I didn't want to. I, I just I couldn't bring myself to come up here and say it. So I just felt sometimes it's better to to speak from the heart, and sometimes the best me messages come from the heart. And so that's what I'm going to do. And uh, I don't want to get into politics too much, but I want to make one thing very clear. It's a big year for this country, and every time you turn on the news, 
you hear somebody say, let's make America great again. And I take offense to that. This is a great country. It always will be, it always has been. At times it's managed and ran better than other times. But this is a great country. But, you know, this, this organization is, has been big uh, for Sheep Shape, for taking on the role of being the title sponsor of Sheep Shape. And I have to thank all the sponsors. Um, it's been awesome to, to be a part of that show and, uh, and to put out that message. Um, it's, uh, so I have to thank, I wish I could thank you all individually, and, and, uh, but just know that I really appreciate it, and we all really do. It's, uh, we really appreciate what you do. So growing up in, in uh, middle Missouri, my goal in life was always to be a pilot. It was, my dad was a pilot, I always looked up to him. Um, he owned a, a business, and uh, that's, uh, that's what I strive to do. I grew up in a Christian family, Christian values, and uh, with strict parents, very strict parents. And um, they, uh, they really pushed us as kids to strive to be the best we could always be. I was always a patriot, I always loved this country. I didn't know how much until September 11th, 2011. I'll never forget that day. I was uh, spraying a 482 acre field in West Texas. And uh, I was about halfway through the field and I went back to, to load up uh, 300 gallons of chemical and I landed and that's when the, the first plane hit the World Trade Center. But when I pulled up in to get the load, there was nobody there. So, you know, time's the money. I mean, if you're not flying, you're not making money. So I jump out of the airplane pissed off and, and I went in there to get the loader guys and, and uh, you know, they were like, hey, look. And so they showed me on TV and, and you know, we, at that point, nobody, nobody knew what was going on. And uh, so I went out, got the load, got back in the air, and uh, I'm, I don't know, I got back to the field and I made about three or four passes in the field and I got escorted back to the airport by an F-16. So <laughs> I knew it was pretty, uh, pretty important that, uh, that I get back and land. Um, so we were grounded, everybody, the whole national airspace system was grounded for, uh, I don't know, five or six days. And I had a lot of time to sit, my blood was boiling, um, I'll try not to say too many bleep words since we can't bleep them out here, but um, yeah, I was pissed. Uh, um, I think every American was. And uh, to me, that's, that day is when I knew how much I love this country and what I needed to do. That was my calling. Although my fam all my family didn't quite agree with me um, because I had a great career. I was a good pilot. Um, but, you know, they were worried because I guess... As a kid, I was always accident prone. I mean, uh, I've had four engine failures in airplanes, complete engine failures. And uh, so they were, they were, they were kind of worried about me. But, um, you know, some people join the military for college, and that's fine. And they join the military because they don't know what else to do with their life, and that's fine. Well, I joined the military for revenge and, um, and to go get justification for, for what they did to us. To me, that's fine. And, you know, to some people it's not, but it is what it is. Um, so I did. I joined the military, and uh, when I took all the tests, the recruiters, they were, um, they couldn't believe that I wanted to go into infantry. Um, my, you know, my scores were high enough. I could have done anything I wanted. Uh, but I wanted to be an airborne infantry guy. I wanted to jump out of airplanes and be on the ground and, and be in the mix of, uh, of all, the, all the stuff that's, that's dangerous and, and uh, get your blood going. But um, so I did my first deployment and, uh, you know, no matter how much you think you're prepared for it, um, you're not. Uh, the first wake up call for me was before the war even started in 2003. We were in Kuwait and that's when uh, Akbar threw the grenades. It was one of our soldiers. I don't, some people may remember it. Some people probably don't know anything about it. Um, but it was one of our soldiers, he slept in the tent right across from me. He was a part of our unit, an engineering battalion, and uh, he threw grenades that killed uh, Americans that night before the war even started. So for me, the war started that, that day. I was, on the, I was on the patrol that night to go down and catch him. We didn't know at first who it was, um, but as, as time went on, you know, pieces come together, and we, we figured out who it was, and um, ultimately we caught him that night. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know where he's at now. I'm sure he's in jail. I know where he should be, but, um, 
You know, it's uh, war's not a not a good thing. Um, nobody likes it. Nobody ever wants to do it. But you do it, and at the end of the day, you do it for your friends and for your family. And uh, you know, I spent 11 months over there. Uh, was in a lot of pretty big missions, high-profile missions. The um, when we got uh, Saddam's boys, it was that was a pretty big day um, for for the American people. And then ultimately when we got Saddam. A lot of people don't agree with that war. I'm not here to justify it or whatever. My country asked me to do something and I went and, I went and did it. Um, I didn't question it. Uh, I don't hold anything against it and I'd go back tomorrow if they asked me to do it again. Um, <laughs> thank you. But I just felt there was something more for me. Um, there was a, a lot of things I could have done in the military, uh, a lot of goals I had. And it's funny how goals change. Um, you know, one friend goes to Special Forces Selection, another one goes to Ranger School, another one goes to Flight School. And you kind of figure out your place and you kind of figure out your calling. And, and uh, I just felt my calling was, was in the air. And uh, so I, I put in a, a packet to go to flight school and was quickly picked up because I had more hours than most of the, the instructors at flight school. So, um, I, so I, I got to get out of Iraq a little bit early um, than my unit, which was hard. It's always hard leaving your brothers and sisters behind. Um, but I went back and uh, went through flight school and just like everything, gave it 110%, busted my butt every day. And uh, in my class, we had the... Uh, the valedictorian, the salutatorian from the West Point Academy in that class, and I smoked them both, and that's just because of work ethic. Uh, I mean, I just, it's competition. Um, so after flight school, I, uh, I, w I was assigned to the 25th Infantry Division in Hawaii, and I went over there, and uh, I didn't get to spend a lot of time in Hawaii. My family did. Uh, I was always training or deployed. Um, but when I went back the second time, it was just different. You know, that our country had kind of pulled everything back and, and we weren't allowed to do what I thought was necessary, uh, you know, what most soldiers that can think thought was necessary. Um, but we still did it. And that's, uh, it's, a, it's a hard thing to, to go over there with, with a mentality of what you think needs to be done, but you still have to you know, obey the orders of, of the guys above you and, and do what they say. It's, it's a tough thing to do, um, especially when you're uh, as passionate about it as that a lot of us was. Um, so I, uh, about three quarters of the way through the deployment on that night, uh, it was 2.30 in the morning. It was March 1st, 2007, 2.30 in the morning. I was uh, flying a, a mission in northeastern Iraq. And I know some of this stuff you heard, but I'll probably go into more detail in it here. But um, we just came back from getting rearmed and refueled. And uh, I was going back to, the, to where we were doing a cordon search. And kind of my trademark move was I'd fly, I was, always flew low. I mean, being a crop duster, that's what you do. And uh, so, I don't know, I was flying four or five feet off the ground and right, off, right, right underneath the power lines and right over the... Uh, right over the buildings of the town, you know, and, and that does a lot for the ground guys too. They, uh, there's that sense of security they feel when they feel that helicopter's overhead and they're watching them because there's a lot of things that we can see whether it's, doesn't matter what the weather is, the, the, the capabilities of that helicopter were amazing. So I flew right over the town, four or five feet off the roofs, pulled it up, did a, did a 78 degree left bank and, and, uh, Every, every bell and whistle in that helicopter went off, and uh, I kind of felt like a bull rider with less time. Um, I had six seconds to make a decision on what, what I was going to do. I leveled the helicopter, which the torque of the helicopter whipped us upside down, so in six seconds somehow, I don't know how I did it. Um, a, lot, a lot at the very beginning, I don't remember, but um, I leveled the helicopter, and uh, I, I can distinctly remember... Um, when I was auto-rotating the helicopter in the beginning, I looked up and I, and I thought I saw some Highline wires. And they weren't Highline wires, it was just a ditch. But, you know, at that point, you're, your mind's going so fast, you know, the, the other pilot in there is freaking out and you're trying to tell him to be quiet because you're trying to fly the helicopter. And, 
And uh, I just did the best I could do. I, I don't know, at 50 feet, I, uh, I did the full auto rotation. And when I pulled the, the collector, the blade snapped. And we hit the ground um, very, very hard. Uh, in excess of 20 Gs, which I think your aortic artery in the high 20s separates from your heart. Um, I remember laying on the ground, my face was, was on, the, on the dirt, and all I could think about at that time was my family. Um, you know, not knowing who was going to get to me first, there was preparations being made because I wasn't going to be on Al Jazeera, guarantee you that. Um, there was preparations being made by me and, and my co-pilot, but he was pinned underneath, you know, all the stuff. I was kind of, it kind of ripped everything away from me. That's what, it cut off my leg initially below the knee. When I grabbed my boot, my calf was sticking out of the boot. Um, my left knee was, had an open knee dislocation, so I was trying to push both bones back in it so I could put on a tourniquet. And, uh, you know, at that point, all your training just kicks in, survival mode. You just, you know, you don't want to die. Nobody wants to die. Um, so we, uh, we, you know, we just did the best we could and, and I'll never forget that American voice, that first American voice that I heard saying, you're going to be all right. And, uh, man, I just, I think I broke down into tears and it took them, I don't know, I think like 12 or 14 minutes to get me out of the helicopter. I died on site right there. I think that's when I flatlined for five, I was dead for five minutes. Um, my co-pilot, they got out pretty quick. Um, he wasn't hurt as bad as me, thank God. I mean, I was in charge of the helicopter and I wouldn't have it any other way. If he would have got hurt worse than me, I wouldn't have been able to live by myself. Um, so they got him out. They got me out, got me back to life somehow. And uh, the last thing I remember is the heat of the Black Hawk when they were putting me on it. I don't remember anything else. Other, everything else is just hearsay. I went to uh, Kirkuk. They did emergency surgery on me there. Um, when I got to Balad, um, that's, that's the second time I died on the way to Balad, and I think at that point, they, uh, that's when they told my family I wasn't gonna make it. And um, it was easy for me. I mean, I just had to, you know, I was, I was unconscious. I was in a coma for about a month and a half, so the, the first time they woke me up was in Landschul, Germany. Um, I had this big, uh, cage wrapped around me, these huge bits drilled through my pelvis. I found out my pelvis was broken five places, um, nine fractured vertebrae, my sacrum was shattered, my spine was completely detached from my pelvis, um, my right knee was dislocated, I mean multiple other injuries like you heard on the, on the video. Um, so they pieced me back together, at least my back at that point. So I was there for about three and a half to four weeks before they were confident that I could make the flight back to the States. That's, this is where I really started to remember details. Um, I remember landing in Washington, D.C. Um, the, the overwhelming support that this country showed us is amazing. And that, that, is, that is to do to the, the people that had served before me, the people from Vietnam that got spit on and booed at. They weren't gonna let that happen to us. And for that, I thank you, if you served in Vietnam or had a family member serve in Vietnam. So we were coming off the tarmac. There was literally thousands of people lined both sides. They were wheeling me in a bed. I'm giving high fives. I'm on so much drugs, I have no idea what's going on. I mean, it was, it was, I was on, I, was, I don't know where I was at, but. So we get up in the hospital room and uh, my family's, all my family's there. I'm, I'm fortunate to have a great family. I have uh, three brothers, five sisters, and uh, my father, my mom passed away when I was young, but I'm sure she was watching out for me overhead. But my, all, every one of my family members was there, even my nephew. My nephew was in flight school at the time. Uh, my nephew and I were really close, always wanting to be like me. He was in the OH-58D class, coming the next class to graduate. They stopped all of flight training because of this, for that helicopter. <clears throat> so he was there, and uh, I remember looking up at my family and every single one of them, except for my wife, was crying. And um, 
I don't I, I mean, like I said, I was on so much drugs. I, I, I didn't know why. Um, I felt good. But uh, my wife knew that if I made it to the States, I was going to live. And there was, I mean, anybody that knows me knows that I don't give up on anything I do. So um, I was at Walter Reed with, with, with all the controversy, which I won't get into all that, but I, I, I faced some of it. And uh, so my family was in the push. My wife and I finally met I could have an a intelligent discussion um, when I wasn't on so much drugs. But uh, we talked, and I didn't want my kids having any part to do with Washington, D.C. I didn't want them growing up there. I didn't want them around there. Um, so uh, we wanted to go to Texas, which is the premier place for amputees in, in the United States. Um, so there was a big push to get me to Texas. My family was... Uh, on it every day, and uh, there at Walter Reed, I think I, I don't know how what what back surgery, what number it was, but uh, it was the they rebuilt my spine and, and my pelvis basically, and just sitting there listening to them doctors talking about how bad I was hurt, how I would never do this, how I would never do that. Um, man, I laid in that bed and. I was on a lot of drugs, but I still understood what they were saying, and it pissed me off to no end. Um, I don't think any doctor, you know, in, the, in that situation should be saying anything like that to anybody laying in a bed, but it, it, it did the opposite for me. It doesn't really bother me. It drives me. So um, when I got to San Antonio, uh, that day, they do an initial big check on you and make sure that you, you, uh, you know, you're good to go or whatever, so, but as soon as they, they did this one test on me and people started running around, doctors were running in and hell, I couldn't figure out what was going wrong. And, and I guess I had this really bad, uh, really bad infection that, that they didn't catch at Walter Reed. And so I went into emergency surgery that night and I was doing uh, emergency or surgeries every other day for three and a half weeks on my back. Um, so here comes the drugs again, a lot of them. Um, so basically, they had to completely rebuild my back again with a different kind of metal because the metal they had in me before, evidently, um, when they gave me an MRI, it started to back it out of my bones and it was pulling it out of my bones. Um, but it, you know, that's that's when, that's guess that's a good thing when you're on so much drugs you don't feel anything anything like that. Um, but so we get through all these surgeries and and uh, they, I still had this infection. They couldn't figure out how to get rid of it. It's the worst they'd ever seen. And um, I remember laying in, the, in my room at night, every night, you know, I tried to be strong around my family. I really didn't, I didn't uh, whine or, or say anything around them, but at, at night secretly, man, I, you know, I couldn't sleep. I, I'd sit awake and I'd sit there and think, why me? Why me? And uh, I'd just ponder on it. And, you know, it was through that, I, I was reading a magazine, it was an ESPN ma magazine, I think, and I read a Vince Lombardi quote. The measure of who we, who we are is what you do with what you have. And that quote has stuck with me every day. And, and uh, I've tried to live by that quote. And uh, we, we as, as a family, my kids, they, they realize it too. And, and f for me, I think it was a, it was a good thing for me getting hurt for them. They learned way more than I ever did. They, it's amazing how, how quick kids, or how kids can pick stuff up, how quick they can pick it up, and, and how you deal with something is, is how they're gonna deal with stuff for the rest of their life. And so for me, I think that was the biggest, uh, the biggest victory, is my kids got to learn something that most kids don't get to learn. And that's, uh, that's powerful. Um, the, uh, after that, it was just the next, the next biggest thing for me was getting off the drugs. Um, is, you know, it's probably the second most addicting thing in, in life is them, all them drugs they had me on. The first is sheep hunting now, but um, <laughs> they, uh, you know, the doctors told me take it easy and wean myself off. Well, I didn't do that. I didn't listen. I, I just stopped cold turkey and uh, think. My, I don't know, because I was out of it most of the time, but my wife said 10 days I didn't sleep. Um, you know, temper tantrums and, 
And, and again, my kids got to see that. Not, that. not that I'm proud of the temper tantrums, but they got to see what, what them drugs will do to you. And people, you know, and they understand that people voluntarily put that stuff in their body, and it's, it's not good. And that was the biggest thing for me. I, I just, and to this day, I've, I've had a few surgeries uh, since I've, I've retired, and I, I won't take pain medicine at all. But um, so I, I got off the drugs. The doctors still were convinced I would never fly again. Um, I would never do this. I would never do that. And, and at that point, I was, I just laughed. And uh, thinking in the back of my head, you son of a gun, I'm going to show you. And uh, my, uh, they had me cut off at, uh, as a knee dysartic, so basically right in the center of your knee. And so when I put on a socket or, or a prosthetic leg, my, um, my knee was off center, so it stuck out about four inches past the other one. And uh, my brother had came and got me and just to get me away from, from all this stuff. I really couldn't walk yet. Um, they didn't want me taking a leg, so my family had to, had to put together like a special ops mission and, and, and distract my, uh, my therapist and my son went and stole my leg and went and put it in the car and we went on vacation. <laughs> so we've, we get to Arkansas and um, my brother now owns the, the family business they're flying and, and I go to jump in an airplane and immediately my knee, and, I, and this is not legal, I mean, I, um, the FAA does not know about it, but um, my brother, uh, um, you know, put me in the airplane. He was sitting in the back seat, so in case something happened, but my knee hit the, hit the dash, and it was a super cub for, for you Canadian Alaskan guys. You all know what they are. Um, so my knee hit the dash, so I was pretty upset about that. Anyways, I, uh, I flew with no problems. Getting on the heel brake was a little, little different. You just had to re I just had to reteach myself a few things. Uh, it, it all went fine, and, you know, so now I go back to San Antonio. Still couldn't walk very well, but I was... I had a little different hitch in my step. I was pretty confident that I could, I could do this now. And, um, but the one thing that bothered me was that my leg. And so I went into my doctor and I told him, I said, you, you need to cut it higher. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And uh, so, um, I don't know, about a week later, I go into surgery for him, to, uh, for him to cut it higher. And the big thing for me is I wanted my knees to be even. And... Once I got that, you know, I had to go through rehab again. You got to wait for it all to heal, and and uh, I got it, got it all healed up, and put on a leg, and then I started on the helicopters. I uh, I got all current and CFI, CFII, and and did all that stuff, and and so the, now that's that's my goal. That's what I planned on doing with my life. I wanted to continue flying helicopters, and and you know, spending time with the with my brothers and sisters, and and uh, brothers and sisters meaning the the wounded brothers and sisters, because I felt like that I could be an inspiration to them, that I could, I could help them out. And um, uh, right before I retired from, from the military, uh, there was an FAA representative in there, and they were talking about air traffic control and how, how they wanted to get air traffic controllers from, from the military and with the military background. And I didn't show any interest in it at first, and then uh, the guy said, well, you can't do it anyway. And I looked at him, and, and, and I was like, oh, really, why not? Well, he was going down my records, and, and so at this point, I'm, at, I'm in the excess of 30 back surgeries, uh, seven or eight surgeries on my left leg, two surgeries on my knee, right knee, multiple arm surgeries, multiple face surgeries. And he's saying, well, you have uh, traumatic brain injury and, and um, post-traumatic stress syndrome. And uh, the post-traumatic stress syndrome... I didn't argue too much because I think anybody that goes over there and they see the things that we see, they do the things that we do, you're going to have post-traumatic stress syndrome. Uh, it affects people in different ways. And uh, I, I feel for me that I was able to deal with it a lot better than most because I was prepared uh, for what, what I was going over there for. I joined the military for what I went over there and did. So I think I was, I was prepared for it. Um, but so the traumatic brain injury I had a problem with because I felt like I could think fine. Um, so I, I got with the, the doctors of the military, the head doctors of the military, and I, and I told them, I said, this is unacceptable. I said, I don't understand how you all can, can label me with, with this severe of, of a brain injury. And he said, well, you, you know, you died and you got hit in the head. And I was like, yeah, but I mean, I still remember my name. So um, 
so I asked him, I said, well, what do, we, what do we need to do? I mean, how can we fix this? And he said, well, you need to take tests. So for seven days straight, that's all I did, eight hours a day, cognitive memory tests, all, all these crazy tests. And when I came out of it, the doctor, you know, the doctor started laughing. He said, well, his IQ is higher than mine. I mean, we can't really deny him. <laughs> so now, again, the FAA was making it pretty difficult for me to be an air traffic controller. Because, you know, you got to think quick. you got to, it's a difficult job. I mean, it really is. But at the end of the day, like I told him, I said, it's not as bad as somebody shooting at you. So, I mean, it, you know, I can do this. And... So now they were making it difficult because they said I needed to send in all my medical records, which are about that high. And uh, so he, I guess he didn't I thought he thought that, you know, that would discourage me and I wouldn't do it. But I went and got them, and instead of sending them, I drove them up there. And uh, so I got I got the appointment to attend the academy. Went to the academy, smoked it. Um, so now I'm in San Antonio. And uh, I've been an air traffic controller since 2009, and I'm one of the best ones there. You have to think like that, by the way, if you're doing that kind of a job. You can't think you're second best. Just like, just like most pilots, they're all the best pilots. So, but, you know, Wild Sheep Foundation last year put on an awesome, an awesome banquet. A great, great week. We were here the entire week. You know, it was Sheep Shape's first season. And um, I can't say how proud we are to have you as a sponsor. This has been a, an awesome, awesome experience doing this show. Uh, we, just, we just finished up season two of Sheep Shape. Uh, the first season was awesome. I hope most of you saw it. Um, if you didn't, you can check it out on Facebook. I think they're going to start running the, the episodes on Facebook. But, um, you know, we all put in our blood, sweat, and tears into that. And, uh, just to try to make it the best we could be. I, uh, I had the privilege of uh, going to the Northwest Territories and hunting with uh, the Simpsons. Um, for my first sheep hunt, um, it was an amazing experience. I mean, I was hooked immediately. Um, it's the most challenging, rewarding hunt I've ever, uh, I've ever experienced or ever could experience. I mean, I, I've, I've been fortunate enough to hunt a lot of stuff in the world, but man, that was, uh, it's just, it's something different. And I, everybody in here, I'm preaching to the choir, I know, but, um, but the Simpsons, you know, I, I couldn't imagine when they get the call saying, hey, there's a one-legged guy going to come up, carry a backpack, and, and hunt sheep. But, uh, you know, I went up there, and I busted my butt, and, um, and I did it. And I know when, you know when we were successful on the sheep, everybody was so amped to, to help me, but I wanted to do everything I could do on my own. I mean, I wanted to pack that thing off myself as much as I could. I mean, I know I couldn't pack it all, but you know, the, the head and the cape and some meat, and I don't know how long it took me to pack it out, but eight and a half, nine hours, I think, or something like that. But it was, it was absolutely an amazing experience. And I have, to, I have all of you all to thank for that. The uh, season two, season two, I'm not gonna talk too much about. You're gonna have to watch, uh, watch it on TV, but you know, I'm pretty excited to announce that Sheep Shape is up for the Best New Series Award. Um, so I will be flying to Vegas tomorrow to, to hopefully accept that award tomorrow night. Um, you know, we want to we wanna do everything we can do to keep that show going and, and always changing it, trying to, trying to do everything we do. I know I feel um, it feels awesome to be put in a position where you can inspire so many people. I know... I must, get, I must get 200 Facebook questions a day because I kind of took the whole getting into shape um, to heart, like everything I do, 110%. So I really busted my butt. And um, from, the, from the very first season of Sheep Shape, I think I weighed 190 pounds. I was 10 or 11% body fat or something. And now I weigh 227. I'm 7% body fat. So I've, I've put in a lot of work. Now I know it's harder to carry that muscle up the mountain. I got a little carried away. So I got to kind of revamp that a little bit, maybe start running some more or something, but, um, you know, I, I just, I can't thank you all enough. I mean, this, you all make this foundation the best in the world, and it's inspiring, it's humbling to me that I, I people from all over the world, um, all over North America come here, they come together, you never see any issues, which is rare in, in this country today. Um, it's, uh, it's humbling. 
And last year at the sheep show, another special, uh, a special God put a, another special guy in my, in, in my life. And that was Ron Rabeau from Wounded Warrior Outdoors. I think everybody knows him. So after the sheep show, uh, he invited me. It was uh, it wasn't you know after the sheep show. So February it would have been uh, middle of February. He invited me to Texas. He was going to have some wounded soldiers down there. He wanted me to come and just sit in and mentor and, and find out what Wounded Warrior Outdoors was about. And uh, so I did. I went down there and hung out with the guys, and it's all it's it's awesome. And you know what he does is it's amazing. Um, it's uh, for us to have people in this country that care that much. He doesn't want any recognition or anything. He just wants to give back. And that's, it's amazing that uh, there's people like that. And Ron, I know where you're sitting. I really appreciate what you do. And uh, I'm, I'm in awe. So it's, it's pretty interesting what he does, at least what he did on that hunt. You know, he incorporates competition in with these guys. So the biggest uh, all dad and longest shot and this and that. And, and it's, it's funny to see these guys, you know, get out there and compete. Some of these guys have never hunted before. And, and you know, hunting is probably the biggest therapeutic. But, I mean, it's just therapeutic, period. I mean, you, you go out, you're outdoors. It, it's not necessarily just hunting, but just being out with your friends, enjoying nature. And, uh, for, you know, hunting, I've seen so many wounded soldiers' lives never hunted before completely just changes their outlook on life. And, you know, it's, it's amazing. And, and people like Ron continue to, to carry that on. So I have, to, I have to talk about another hunt I did this year. It was a pretty special hunt, again, through Ron with Wounded Warrior Outdoors and Eddie Corona with uh, Outdoor Experience for All from Arizona. They called me to go on this elk hunt. And it wasn't just an elk hunt. It was an elk hunt that was donated by a Vietnam veteran that was wounded in Vietnam and he had passed away. And he wanted this tag to go to uh, another wounded veteran. So I went out um, to Arizona, and not really fully knowing what to spec expect. I, I'd, I'd never hunted elk before. Um, but I knew it was a special hunt. And uh, my biggest thing is I just wanted to, I, you know, when the guy was looking down on me, I want to make him proud. And so we get out there, and man, I busted my butt. I mean, over 30 miles in four days. And uh, on the second day, I, compl I ripped open my scar on my left leg. When I, that night when I pulled my liner off, I have a liner that goes over it. When I pulled that off, blood and juice and whatever it was just ran out. And uh, I mean, I can't explain to you how bad it hurt, but I wasn't going to quit. So I just put it back on and, and we went out and we got it done. Uh, killed a monster elk. Uh, it had, a pro, it had a point broke off, but it was 382 inches, so it was, a, it was an amazing elk, and I have Eddie and, and Ron to thank for that, and you know, I, hopefully I made that family proud that donated that elk, because um, I did it just like anybody else would do it. And that's the thing with uh, wounded soldiers. That whole, the whole disability thing I don't like. Everybody has disabilities. It's the abilities that matter, and your abilities offset your disabilities. So, fortunately, I don't quit, and I really don't feel pain until I'm laying in bed. So <laughs> that's, uh, I guess that's a good ability to have, but especially in this, in this uh, setting. But this, this year, season three of Sheep Shape is going to be an amazing, amazing experience. I'm going to take my daughter to uh, New Zealand. We get my, da my daughter loves to hunt. She's an awesome outdoor artist, and uh, so she's going to go to New Zealand and, and get the trip of her life. And then I have another special hunt that my brother bought me. I'm not going to bring it up because I want it to be a surprise, but it's a once-in-a-lifetime deal. And fortunately, I have a brother that's, uh, that loves me and uh, evidently loves me a lot and, uh, <laughs> and uh, got me a hunt of a lifetime. But, you know, the big thing tonight I wanted to, I wanted to put in here is goals. And uh, goals is not anything that, that this organization's not used to. I mean, it sets goals for itself and it exceeds them every year. So tonight, this year, our goal is to beat last year. It's easy. All we gotta do is just raise more money than last year and we can do it. And uh, when you all see me Friday night at the auction hopping in through here without a leg, that means I pawn mine in Vegas at the pawn shop to buy my next sheep hunt. Thank you all very much and uh, have a good night. Have a wonderful week. Thank you.